Welcome to this week. At its fourth meeting in South Sudan's capital, Juba, earlier in the week, the ceasefire and transitional security arrangements monitoring mechanism, CITISAM, highlighted issues on the need for freedom of movement and transitional security arrangements. David Lukan from Radio Miraya attended the opening session and filed this report. Earlier in his opening statement at the meeting, the chairperson of the city, Sam General Mola Haile Mariam, said continued restrictions on the movement of peace monitors was unacceptable. General Haile Mariam said the situation in South Sudan remains volatile and the restrictions are posing a big challenge for the monitoring verification teams, MVTs, to carry out their work. The MVTs are still requested by parties to get a permission letter from their respective highest level authorities on a case-by-case -case basis, which hinders the access of MVT and delays the process of investigation. The continuation of hindrance of access for MVTs is unacceptable and must stop immediately. General Haile Mariam said that no permission letter should be required for monitoring verification teams to conduct investigations, adding that cooperation of parties in South Sudan and the strong support of international community was necessary. Our road is Aldous. The road ahead is long, but I am confident that with the concerted effort of CITISAM members and the support of international community, especially the cooperation by parties in South Sudan, will achieve the objective of ensuring faithful and comprehensive implementation of the PCTSA and above all, the early restoring of peace and stability in people in South Sudan. Briefing media after the citizen meeting, communications officer Ruth Feeney said ceasefire monitors have forwarded a report of five violations committed by both the government and forces of the SPLM in opposition to the Joint Monitoring and Evaluation Commission for investigation. I, I would not go into more specific, specific information about who, who was implicated where, as that is... is uh, the job of the JMEC and they have the authority to make these these reports public but today it's fair to say that both parties are implicated in the reports that were discussed today. The ceasefire and transitional security arrangements monitoring mechanism CTSAM is responsible for monitoring compliance and reporting directly to the Joint Monitoring and Evaluation Commission JMEC on the progress of the implementation of the permanent ceasefire and transitional security arrangements. In the northern part of the country, the World Food Programme began airdrops in areas that have not been accessible to humanitarian agencies. Airdrops of vegetable oil and other food supplies on Ganiel, a place that has for months been inaccessible to humanitarian agencies, were dropped by aircraft, a means that has proved quite expensive over time for the World Food Programme. Regardless, the United Nations Food Agency has recently been able to provide food and nutritional assistance to more than 90,000 people in Ganiel area. Most of the people in Ganiel fled from fighting in other parts of South Unity states like Lea, Koch and Mayendiet and have in the past two years sought refuge in Ganiel. We the women have been suffering since the fighting erupted in the country. We have been separated from our husbands. Some of them have been killed while defending our community. We have lost our livestock and belongings. We had nothing until you began to bring us food. It is estimated that 2.8 million people in South Sudan, nearly 25% of the country's population, have remained in urgent need of food assistance between January and March, which is the period just before the lean season. This is 84% higher than the same period last year and due to the combined effects of more than two years of fighting, a collapsing economy, high food prices and erratic rainfall. We have about 10 to 15 of our field teams out, out in the field uh, doing mobile operations in areas, including in these areas in Unity where there has been 
uh, concern that certain people are facing catastrophic food insecurity conditions. And we're really managing to get the mobile teams into those places at the moment. And if we can sustain and increase this access, there's every chance that we'll be able to prevent a famine in South Sudan as, as the lean season approaches. As the food drops continue, the World Food Programme remains concerned that increasing tensions and violence may lead to deepening humanitarian needs in part of the country that were not directly affected by fighting in the past two years, including Western Equatoria, Western Barrel Ghazal, and Greater Pibo. Recent outbreaks of fighting have occurred in areas along major routes used by WFP to transport food to the rest of the country, and this may delay WFP's annual exercise to pre-position stocks in places that become impossible during the rainy season. After South Sudan's recent admission into the East African community, there have been numerous debates reflecting various views of this inclusion. A debate on Radio Mirai's Democracy in Action program highlights some of the views that have been had across the nation. Did South Sudan meet the requirements for it to be a member of EAC? Of course, we have been admitted, but not easily. We have had six months of negotiations or even more. And of course, since we applied 2011, we have been uh, preparing ourselves for uh, for accession to the East African community. So it has not been easy. It has been tough, actually, mm -hmm. but we managed. Of course, we met, uh, we met all the criteria. I mean, the, 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 the conditions that were, uh, uh, that they wanted us to fulfill. And that is, of course, definitely, naturally, we are, uh, we, 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 we are neighbors to, to one of the I mean, to two or three of the of the uh, of, of the, the countries that are partners in the yes. ESC, in the ESC. That's one condition. But well, the fact that we have negotiated our way through, we were we were not allowed in simply because we are brothers and sisters. So uh, the six months of negotiations have actually qualified us to enter into the ESC. Yes, uh, Honourable. He is talking about in terms of geographical uh, 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 proximity which is one of the conditions to be a member of e EAC. But what about the other conditions? Like, for instance, uh, microeconomics policies, infrastructures, and others? The other requirement which is needed is also the, uh, the economic viability of the, the, the country, country that is now going to join this, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, this community. And, uh, and also the... Uh, and when we talk about economic uh, viability, we see when we are joining the East African, East African community, it's about the trades. So when you are going to join, what do you have uh, to present to this community, say that you become part of that community, and then also your, 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 your productions is, will be uh, acceptable to this. But it seems that South Sudan does not have all this, but I don't know what criteria that was uh, used to admit the South Sudan. Though we have a lot of challenges, we are a landlocked uh, country, and we have also uh, dependence on uh, one, or, uh, one source of revenue. So we are a consuming country more than a producing country. So we are, we are going to import things from our side. Thank you for saving my life. This appreciation message from South Sudan's National Blood Bank goes out to 96 peacekeepers who donated 96 pints of blood this week. As part of a national blood donation campaign, 96 peacekeepers donated 96 pints of blood in a voluntary drive organized by the National Ministry of Health with support from the World Health Organization. The blood from both male and female peacekeepers is expected to help boost supplies at the country's national blood bank, which is run by the country's Ministry of Health. We're doing this for the community and the citizen out there, for the people who are in need, especially the children and the mothers who are in need of blood, um, and then the people who are getting in a vehicle accident and so. Donating blood continues to be encouraged among South Sudanese and foreigners alike during blood donation campaigns, as blood can help save the lives of those in need. 
it is part of the uh, working together with the uh, local uh, authorities that belongs to the uh, health facility here in South Sudan. And uh, on the same time, we are uh, actually trying to motivate our peacekeepers to contribute with their blood, literally, to help the South Sudanese. Those donating blood walk in and get registered while being asked a series of questions to ascertain that they qualify to donate blood. For regular blood donors, they must take at least three months between blood donations. Among other requirements, those donating blood must also be free from diseases and must also weigh more than 50 kilograms with normal hemoglobin levels. Donated blood is screened regardless to ascertain its purity. It is a selfless service. We give blood uh, to the needed people and there is no harm to the people who, give, uh, who are giving blood. So uh, it is a selfless service and uh, it, it doesn't uh, uh, make any compromise in our health. So yeah, we came here to give blood so that uh, the needy people like uh, who are dying of uh, shock, of uh, uh, loss of blood, uh, even for pregnant people, even uh, lots of people requ require blood. Uh, there is a lot of challenge that we face, especially from the citizen, um, like a cultural belief. Uh, some of the citizen will tell us that uh, I cannot donate blood because I have no food to eat. And some will say, I cannot give my blood, I will die. And these are all false. I need them to, to know that if you give uh, blood to help the, the, other, the other person, it will be really great because in your body you have six liters. And if you give only 0.5, that will save another life. And our job is to collect the blood and save uh, other people's life. With people being encouraged to donate freely and as often as possible, it is hoped that various needs across the country will continue to be fulfilled. The response is really, really, really big. And let's hope our goal was uh, to collect about 140 again, but it, we are just doing it for one day. So let's hope that we collect about 100 or 90. And as the day ends on every blood donation campaign exercise, and with the team from the National Blood Bank going home fulfilled, it is hoped that every pint of blood collected will add towards ensuring that an adequate and reliable supply of safe blood is accessible to health institutions countrywide. It is also hoped that masses will rally into various centers across the nation to donate the much needed blood. In our next story, we meet a human rights officer who works for the United Nations mission in South Sudan. Working day and night with the hope that her work will impact someone's life, raise awareness on issues and change attitudes within her community, Mundua Isabella is motivated to go on and on. Here is her story. My name is Mundua Isabella Jerome. I am a human rights officer with ONMIS in Kwajok. I arrived in the office. The first thing I do, check my emails and see whether there is an urgent matter which needs to be done before I go to the field. If there, if there is, then I first do what is required. Thereafter, I go to the field. I either plan to go to the police station or go to the communities, talk to them about human rights. So you also plan for field missions with the other components like civil affairs, gender, child protection, and all. MLO, for two to three days, we go to the field, we monitor human rights situation on the field, uh, we talk to the community about their situation, what is going on, how are women treated, the children, how they are treated, how they are feeling, and what they want us to do for them, how we can help them. One of the touchable moments is one day I went to Special Protection Unit, where I went this morning. Uh, we met a lady with her child. 
as while I was interviewing her, I wanted to know why she was there, what she was doing there with the baby. Through the interview, she told me that she did not commit any crime. She did not commit any crime. Uh, her, her brother and the, her brother and the relative brought her in, kept her there because her husband did not pay the dowry. Thereafter, I went and talked to the police who was investigating this case. I asked him, why is this woman here? And then he told me the same thing that lady told, told her. So I advised the police to immediately contact the, the brother who brought this woman here because the lady has not bro uh, the lady did not commit any crime. She's just detained illegally. And I felt so great when the lady was released from detention. That was my greatest moment. At least I knew I had an impact on somebody's life. <sighs> as a South Sudanese and working as a human rights is a big challenge. Like in the field, people don't like most of the people we interact with, like they don't like to hear anything to do with human rights. But we tell them, no, it's not all about reporting negative things. We are just trying to work together. We are trying to work together to see how, how we can improve from this situation to a better situation to change the attitude of the community. We need to educate them about the right of women to education, right of women to participate, in the public life, be it in politics, be it economic, social, economic, or cultural life. By doing that, by raising awareness, South Sudan will become the South Sudan we want. Like peace, peace-loving country with peace-loving people. We shouldn't lose hope with what is happening today. To end our show, we will leave you with our voices of peace. This week, we feature youth from Malakal who speak about what peace means for them. We will leave you with their thoughts. Goodbye for now and join us again next week. Kamana <laughs> Ezra